So I think we'll get started. Uh, so Neen Delavisa, Cheryl Simon, Gipu Begum Jeej, Abigail I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Cheryl Simon. I am from PEI. The word that I actually use, Abigail it actually means like it's the, the people like of the island. So it's a little bit of a distinction um, with respect to that. But I'm excited to see some of my uh, faces, especially the ones I remember from just the class that I gave a little while ago. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about Aboriginal and Indigenous law. Is there a difference? Because the answer is absolutely there is. And we're going to walk through what those differences are. I've brought some birch bark to highlight and demonstrate some of the components about Indigenous law that sometimes is difficult to take out of the abstract. So as I said, my name is Cheryl Simon. Um, I'm an Onu Ebit, which means that I'm a, a Mi'kmaq woman. The picture that I have here is what I usually use for my introduction. It's my favorite picture, and it's my son, and when he was a few months old, out picking sweetgrass, um, not too far from Peggy's Cove. And whenever we're talking about Indigenous law, Indigenous everything, everybody in my family, the elders, community members, knowledge keepers, always say, you have to take your kids. You have to take your kids with everything that you do. So this was Declan getting used to being on my back in the rocking motion, bending down, picking up, the smell of the sweet grass patch, because every time the wind blows and the grass moves, you can smell it, you know, the, the heat, the bugs, everything that goes along with it. And this was literally the start of the knowledge transfer, you know, when it comes to, to my, my children. So my background is actually, I'm, I'm new to academia. I have spent pretty much my entire adult life working with indigenous communities across the country. Um, I worked very briefly in a law firm, but realized that it wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't why I went to law school. The clients I had, I was a corporate lawyer, uh, they weren't who I wanted to work with. And so I, I left that very quickly and started working with a national organization developing culturally relevant and uh, appropriate governance structures. And so I've been in flying communities, we've been to like some communities where you have to go through a ceremony to even get into the talk with the, the leadership in the communities, and it was a really dynamic job. But then having children, I came back and it's been a really fantastic working just in my own territory. And, and so even though my district is Ebiguit, uh, it, it's nice to be in Mi'kmaq territory. I remember when I moved home, I stopped in at the gas station in Truro and I walked in and the guy behind the desk says, oh, what's your band number? Because it's like, oh my Lord, he recognizes me as Mi'kmaq. It was just so refreshing to be back home again. So I'm going to start out with this presentation, just talking about some terminology. Um, because I think a lot of it gets complicated. People get nervous and scared to use words because they're not sure if they're going to offend, what's appropriate. So I thought that that would be a good starting point. And then I'm going to walk through it, some sources of Indigenous law, what people are writing about it, but then also, like I said, with the birch bark, give some really practical examples of what we mean by it. It's something that I was just speaking with my mother. She's an elder in PEI, and uh, she and Albert uh, Marshall and some other people were talking about it's now safer for Indigenous people to start sharing because for a long time, it, it had to be hidden. It was, you know, we were worried about it being misappropriated, used in the wrong way, and, but now it's safer. It's so they're saying like we have to now as Indigenous people go out and start actively sharing more about what we know and how we think and what our worldview is. So I'm going to start giving those examples based on my experiences. Then we're going to move on to Aboriginal law to demonstrate that distinction between the two concepts. And then also talk about moving forward because throughout the course of this, you're going to see the vast differences between Aboriginal and Indigenous law. But what do we do with that as Canadians? Right? How, what does reconcil like reconciliation even mean? Is it just a buzzword? If we don't put meaning into this and if we don't have action items with it, then it's only ever going to be a word. And when it comes to Mi'kmaq language, we're verb-based. We most 80% of our words are based on, on verbs, right? Action items. So I also we have to breathe the life into this to make it sure that these are verbs that we're talking about and not just nouns. So let's get started. So first of all, who are we, right? We're on Mi'kmaq territory, but the word Mi'kmaq is not actually from, it's a post-contact word. I remember when I moved in with my grandmother, um, she would always talk about onu. And so onu is the word that we have for ourselves. It's, it's what we use in our language, and it basically translates to like one of the people. 
And a lot of indigenous nations across this country, their words for themselves usually have a similar translation, right? One of the people. And the cool thing about this is that it's not based necessarily on like, like a, a particular ethnicity. So if I, as a Mi'kmaq person, am talking about another Mi'kmaq person, I would call them an Olnu. But if I'm also talking about people that are Cree or Blackfoot or Haudenosaunee or you know, Gitsan, because they're one of the people too, they're indigenous, I would use the same word for them. So it's kind of like a really nice relational type of word to use that connects people to it. So Mi'kmaq is the, the post-contact word. It's not offensive, <laughs> thank goodness, right? Um, but it comes from, like there's a couple of different theories as to where it comes from. Um, but really it is kind of a derivative of words for our larger extended kinship systems. So you can kind of picture like one of those you know, TV commercials, like what word would you have for this village? And it's like, oh, Kanada. So I kind of thinking the same thing. When people came in and like, you know, what word would you have for everybody? Because we had really expansive kinship system, it makes sense that that's the type of word that we would use to describe everybody. So that's where the word Mi'kmaq comes from. But the people that started developing the written language, we had um, a symbol, like a, they call it a, a suckerfish writing system. Uh, in English, uh, it, it's like a hieroglyph. And so we had a writing system, but the orthography was developed by linguists. And so the pronunciation of our vowels is similar to French. And the K's are like a G, and the Q's I'm a silent, the T's like a B, this type of thing. So in that orthography, that writing system, Mi'kmaq would be spelt like that. But if you're British, and coming to this territory and have no interest in actually learning the language, you would look at it and say it and write it in English, and that's where Mi'kmaq comes from. So that's why we've moved away from Mi'kmaq, and either Olnu or Mi'kmaq are the words that we use for ourselves. So people you'll commonly hear, and some of the old folks admittedly will use Mi'kmaq because it's kind of you know, what they grew up with when they're speaking in English, but in our language, it definitely Olnu is what you hear people using more often. So another important phrase is indigenous nations. And these are the traditional governance systems. Unfortunately, in Canada, there's no legal mechanism to recognize an indigenous nation. And what I mean by that is like, think about Mi'kmaq, right? Like we cover five different provinces, but if we wanted to come together and work as a nation and pass laws, have gatherings, this type of stuff, people tend to deal with us based on the provincial boundaries. And if we want to hold property, you know, if we want to be like an education authority, for instance, there's no legal mechanism for the Mi'kmaq nation to exist. And so that is a bit of a problem when you're talking about nationhood and self-governance and reconciliation, if we're literally unable to, to function within the current Canadian society without having that recognition. That is different than bans. And even though the tone of my voice bans, the way that I said that, right, it bans, that is something that was created under the Indian Act. And when indigenous people started saying, like, we are self-governing, we are nations, we're the first nations of this country, the government, in very typical fashion, said, oh, okay, well, we'll scratch out the word banned and use first nation and just keep functioning along. But this is actually just the smaller communities. It's not actually the nation. So my, my band, my Indian Act band, is Abiguit in PEI, which is an anglicized version of Ebiguit, the name of the district. But it's just a community. And yet, people call us the Abiguit First Nation. That kind of waters down the claim to nationhood. right? So it's important to know that distinction in terms of what we're actually talking about. That being said, there is some overlap. Picture a bit of a Venn diagram, right? Because those communities, even though most of them are constructs of the Indian Act, they are still groups of Mi'kmaq and indigenous people living together with governance structures that are still like, you know, expressing themselves culturally, legally, all this type of stuff. So there is overlap there, but sometimes you'll see people wearing almost two hats, right? Like, am I acting as an Indian Act chief right now, or am I acting as the leader of a Mi'kmaq community? And some bands, like Medbanagia in New Brunswick, their Indian Act band is actually the same village site that people have been living on for over 4,000 years. So when you go up there, it's a really great energy. It wasn't forced. It was just people never left that site. So sometimes there's overlap. But there is a distinction between bands and nations. And it's important to, to remember that just calling something a First Nation doesn't make it so.
Oh, I forgot to say, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask as I go along, right? Like, I'd hopefully get some really good dialogue going with this. Okay, on the way to Blue Dawn. I was going to put the, the translation, but then I was like, no, because I've been told by people like Duma Young that if you put the English words, people will use the English and not learn the Mi'kmaq. So only way to blue on roughly is like this, the, our legal ways, the ways that we govern ourselves, our legal system, right? And, and you hear it a lot more. People are not calling it our laws, only way to blue on or Mi'kmaq to blue on or Mi'kmaq well to blue on. Right, there's different um, derivatives of it. Um, but it's very expansive, and it's not like the Canadian system. But it's definitely something that we're going to be talking about, again, with the birch bark as we go on through. So I, as an Ulnuk person on Ulnuk territory, dealing with Ulnuk de Blunaan, it automatically shifts it kind of more into that nationhood concept as opposed to using English words and thinking about laws the way that people are used to looking at, you know, a piece of legislation, a, you know, a court decision, that type of thing. That is different from Aboriginal law. Aboriginal law is where there is intersection between Indigenous peoples and the Crown, right? So treaties, um, impact benefits agreements, things where we're, we're dealing with um, entities that are outside, external to our nations. That's Aboriginal law. And it's really distressing when people who are practicing mm -hmm. Aboriginal law think that they're practicing Indigenous law because the tendency is for people to interchange the words when we're describing people, right? Am I an Aboriginal person? You know, well then I must be practicing Aboriginal law. When, what's the difference if I use Indigenous? Uh, there was actually a lawyer that I know in southern Alberta working for an oil and gas company. And because when people start saying Indigenous as opposed to Aboriginal, he's like, oh, I, I, I practice Indigenous law. Like, I can guarantee you do not, right? I can guarantee that you representing oil and gas do not. Um, so it's really important to know that just because people in kind of common language are using those words interchangeably, they do have meaning and it's important to know. Which brings me to indigenous peoples. Um, the S, as I'll say in my class, is really important because that is the recognition of the self-governance rights of, of a group, of an ethnic group, right? So if we're talking about indigenous peoples, that includes like the Mi'kmaq nation, the Blackfoot nation, the Cree, you know, this type of stuff. They're, and it's not race-based. This is something that the government has really done a good job of teaching people in Canada that indigenous peoples are a race. And the concept of race comes about from 17th century Europe in order to justify slavery. You had to dehumanize people, you had to create an other to justify the slave trade and what at the time was the, you know, the foundation of the global economy. So this idea that indigenous peoples as a nation are a race is something that is just not a fact. It's a, it's a fiction. And so you, when you hear people talking about, oh, like I'm a full Indian or a half Indian or something like this, they're talking about, like they, they've internalized a system of supremacy They've internalized a system of like breeding something out and not having a thriving like nation based on like a, a civic model, like, like Canada, right, as a country. There's a lot of different people that make up Canada, but for some reason when we're talking about indigenous peoples, people think race and, and they start thinking about things like skin tone, you know, color, this type of stuff, and that, that's not what our nationhood is about. So any questions about this terminology that I've kind of... That was a lot to dump on you right at the beginning, but is that, okay, I'll move forward then. Okay, because I have some more. So Ulnuizidi is like, let's talk about Mi'kmaq, right? So again, just a little bit of a recap, we've got the Ulnu, Mi'kmaq, and um, with the Q, and Mi'kmaq with the W, that's just grammar, right? One's um, a noun, one is an adjective. The, the W is an adjective. Um, so that, that's what that is. Our land, if you're talking about Mi'kmaq people, then Mi'kmaqi is the land of the Mi'kmaq. Um, our nation, again, Mi'kmaq, or an Ulnuk nation, indigenous peoples, and our legal system, Ulnuk way to blue dawn. So I swear that there won't be a test, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a recap without the, the definition that's there. Okay, so now that we've got that down, we know who I am, um, let's start talking about Ulnuk way to blue dawn. See, I shouldn't have put it down with the, with the English. So this is my great, 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 
um, one of my, my, my ancestors, one of my grandmothers, she's actually technically a great, great, great aunt, but we don't refer to them that way. It's a, it's a grandmother of mine. Um, my grandfather was from the uh, Shubanagdi, um, but he, his family was actually from the valley, and then the government forced everybody up to, to Shubanagdi um, band, again, with that tone, to try to centralize people. So this is one of my grandmothers in, in my family. So when we're talking about Ulnawe de Bludon, the great John Burroughs, and he would probably laugh at me for calling him that, um, has spent a lot of time thinking about the different commonalities that indigenous nations have when it comes to de Bludon, right? What are some things that are kind of similar? And he has five, and he will be the first to say that this list is not um, exclusive. There, there's definitely overlap, and it's just some of the systems. So I, with the humility that I have, would like to add a sixth with material culture. And I'm going to explain to you why I think that that's important. But so this area of sacred law, natural law, deliberative law, I, I, positivistic law, and then customary. Some of these are easier to understand as mainstream Canadians than others. But I'm going to walk through and give examples of these under the the guidance of my, my grandmother. So let's start talking about sacred law. Examples of sacred law include things that, uh, like our creation stories, for instance. Um, and if you go online, you can Google Mi'kmaq creation story, and there's a wonderful YouTube videos that will come up that will walk you through. Stephen Augustine um, is a cousin of mine, and a few people, they, like, they've developed these productions. So I encourage you to, to take a look at them, right? Because we're on Mi'kmaq territory. But I want to talk a little bit about another area of sacred law, and that's with what the first treaties are. Whenever I first started learning about the treaties, the elders group in New Brunswick always said, you have to start with the first treaties, right? You can't just start talking about the treaties with the British. You have to talk about the first treaties. And I've really come to understand that that is really critical because these sacred treaties are ancient. They were way before we had contact, and they govern like with the Dabluda on, they govern the way that we interact with the beings that we share our territory with. So these first treaties are with things like Madwas, Lamu, and Muin. Right? So again, try not to use the English words, but I thought I'd give you a visual aid as to which animals we're talking about. So there is a story, for instance, about Madwas up there on the top left. Madawas and the Ulnuk had an agreement. They had a sacred treaty, and it had to govern the obligations and the, and the conditions of interacting with the Madawas people. And we always talk about the people that we enter into treaties as people, right? So the, the Blamu people, the Madawas people, the Muin people, because there's no distinction in our language in the Ulnuk about between hominoids and non-humanoids. We're all beings, we all share our territories, we all have autonomy. And so the treaties were entered into with these beings. So Madawes, for those that don't know, is a rodent, extremely peaceful animal, right? Very peaceful. They're really cute too. I encourage you if you ever see one, they are adorable. They've got these little paws. The babies are just really, I just, I want one, but my husband says no. Um, so I do a lot of porcupine quill work. So this is why Madawes is really near and dear to my heart, right? So Madawes is a really peaceful um, animal, doesn't do harm. The quills are purely for defense really, really kind creature. And back in the ancient times, or the, so the treaty was that we would be able to use quills, we would be able to use the animal, but we had to be respectful of the values that Madawas brought to this relationship. And so this is why we use the quills in our art form. You know, we do sometimes eat the meat. It's the last step in my relationship with Madawas. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I hear it's tasty. Um, but this, this, this coexistence that was based on responsibilities and obligations. But there was a warrior in Unamagi who took the quills and thought, you know, that would make a really good addition to a war club. Right? And so attached the quills and used it deliberately to inflict pain. When Madawas found out about it, livid, this was a violation of our agreement with respect to how we were going to interact with each other. Mi'kmaq people broke it. Unamagi has never had porcupine since. Um, they've even tried introducing them. And if you think about how prolific breeders, uh, rodents can be, it's pretty astounding that it hasn't worked. So this violation is really in the old times, and we still haven't atoned for it. They're still not back on that territory. 
Right? So these are the type of stories that when I was starting to do my art with porcupine quills, I was taught because you have to understand the conditions of your interaction. If you're going to harvest the quills and you're going to use them, you have to make sure that you're upholding the obligations and the peaceful nature and what the conditions were that Madhuas put on that relationship. So this is an example of some of the sacred law, this is the first treaties that we have. I have a lot of stories with, with, about Blamu and Munasu, like it just, Munasu is actually, there's a story about um, Munasu is the, uh, the female, and she adopted a big bad boy and, and into the family. And, and so this idea that like, that is the degree of relationship. And we have a lot of teachings from Muin. Um, they are actually self-medicating animals. So if they get hurt, they will seek out the plants that will give them pain relief, help them heal. And that's where a lot of the teachings that Mi'kmaq people have with medicines on the land come from. So there's a lot at stake when it comes to upholding your responsibilities with these areas of the law. But they're also the foundation of what went into the later treaties with the British. Right? They're the reason why some of our conditions and some of our, like, our practices and our dibludan um, are not, we, we can't compromise on them. Because where we're coming from with our worldview goes back to the ancient times. And we are still upholding. This is why when if I harvest, I have to make offerings. This is why if I'm taking bark, I have to go to the tree and tell them who I am and what I'm going to do with the bark that I take from it. Right? So they're very strict teachings that are still being taught to people. And I think people think that because it's a modern era, you know, it's 2024, that this stuff doesn't still apply. But this is what we're actively teaching. For instance, when I have my child on my back and I'm out harvesting, he has to know the responsibilities that he has with it, and that all comes back to the sacred law. And again, it's not for like, I do not want to be the one that drives some of these animals off our territory. So another component, there's two words here. One of them are probably familiar to people. Nedugalim is the harvesting, like only take what is needed. Right, so I've already talked about the fact that Olnug doesn't mean just humanoids. So what is needed is not just what humans need. It's also what Madhuas needs, what Blamu, all of the beings on our territory, right? And so Nedogalump has been used a lot to explain to people um, fisheries. You know, with, with the fishing activity, post-martial, this type of stuff, but why there's concern about the way that the fishery is being regulated and the principles that Mi'kmaq people have. But some of the elders that I work with in New Brunswick they, it's a bit, they're getting uneasy with so much focus on Nedugalim because it's a harvesting activity. And that seems to align with Western, um, uh, Western ideals regarding individual rights to harvest. And that's not the foundation of what our laws are. You have to couple that with ideas like unquotum, which is the caring for something. And when you do that, it decenters de human activity and makes the resource the center and the focus. Because you can't, if you're not caring for what it is that you want to harvest, you won't be able to have medical function, right? So it, it's more about balance and making sure that the harvesting is only a subset of what we do when we're out in the woods or on the waters or things like that, and you have to understand it. I put this picture here of a basket to illustrate this point. So this basket is made out of black ash, wisco, and it is um, under threat by a beetle called an emerald ash borer beetle. There's no stopping this beetle on this territory. It will kill off every ash tree. Um, we, we haven't figured out a way to say it. It's an invasive species. And I cannot even begin to explain to you what it feels like, I'm going to even get emotional, to know that activity that my answers have done will end in my lifetime. It will end. And so if we take these principles of unquotum about caring for something and nedigalim, what it does is that it makes my needs as a basket maker not the focus of this. We've been spending a lot of time with my uncle. I made this basket for him as a reflection to the teachings that he gave me as he was teaching me how to do baskets. It was my gift to him to demonstrate how well he taught me. And part of those lessons have to deal with Angkwodam and Nedugalim because with the, with the beetle coming, you go out to the woods and there's a temptation to say, well, we should just like cut down the trees that are still healthy. That way we can have a stockpile and we can keep teaching the kids and we can do it, right? But that's also a very commodification kind of approach, individualistic approach to it. That would completely disregard the Mi'kmaq teachings of things like Angkwodam and Nedugalim. And my uncle was like, no, because if we do that, then the beetle's not the problem, then we're the problem, 
right? So his focus and what we've been really working on is documenting the process, the step-by-step -step process of how to do sp um, splint basketry that way and, and collecting seeds. And the, tr the trees only give seeds every once every seven years. And you have to have the mature trees that give up those seeds. So you, and there was a couple when we were out in the woods this summer, I was like, no, we can't go get that because I got them just two years ago. We're going to have to wait another five years before the seeds come. And I'm like, let's hope that that tree lives five years before the beetle kills it. Otherwise, we won't be able to get more seeds. So we've been focusing on getting seeds, documenting the process in the hope, in the real hope that when the beetle has finished ravaging the species, that we will have enough seeds and hopefully the woods will be in a condition that is good enough to be able to replant and then we'll have stored away our knowledge with the seeds and then future generations can bring it back. What I'm worried about, though, is that part of the reason why so many of the trees are under threat is because climate change is making them sick, right? You go through the woods, you see leaves on trees, you think that they're healthy, but they are not. And so I don't know if the beetle would have been able to get as bad as it was if the woods were healthier, right? So this is, again, the practical application this summer of these principles that, that we're using. Any questions about that? All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, right now, let's just hope they don't mutate. Well, let's hope they don't. Um, and also, it, like, it takes seven years for the tree to get the seeds, and then it takes three years for the seeds to actually germinate, to even get to the sapling, right? So like, we're, we're talking about time frames that are just not capable of dealing with that kind of threat. So it, it's just fingers crossed. OK. So let's talk about natural law. This is why I brought the bark. Natural law, and when you read John Burroughs' description of that, I think that that's an area that people have a lot of difficulty trying to visualize, right? It's very abstract. Like this idea that you can know the land in a way that you are actually getting legal principles from the land itself, and the land is speaking to you. And I always kind of laugh when I say that because I th when we used to talk about the land speaking to us, like look what Disney did, right, with the talking trees and Pocahontas and stuff. That, that's not what we're talking about, right? Um, so when I talk about talking with the trees, um, it means that you have to, when you, when you start working with them, you have to learn the tree, right? Like I said, you literally have to go out and introduce yourself to the trees. So this is my friend Kay. She was one of my apprentices dealing with the porcupines. She is teaching her son Riley. This is the picture of his first harvesting of a birch tree. And she, if you see, she's got her hand on his hand to literally show him the amount of pressure that's used, you know, like it's every step of the way. So the trees, when we harvest the bark, it's a very, it's a sustainable practice. Um, what happens is that, it, this sounds weird as humanoids, but like after the solstice, the tree starts actually already preparing for winter. It will pull all of the sugar water out of the, the leaves and the branches into the core of the tree, run it down to the roots in preparation of going dormant. So because of that, all of the layers of bark fuse together and it comes, it, like it feels almost leathery. Right? And this is when we harvest it to make wigwams, to make canoes, um, and it's strong. Like you, you could go, like they used to go um, ocean going canoes in, in birch bark, uh, made out of birch bark. And so this is what happens after you've harvested. A scab will form around the tree. That will stay on for about five years or so. And then when the scab falls off, this is what the tree looks like. And the cool thing is, is that if you really know your trees, you can actually tell from the outside how thick they are. Right? You can also tell where they are in the healing process. And it's really frustrating when people will like, oh, let's just go harvest. Like, look at that tree. But they don't know that it's already been harvested. Like, you can tell the difference, like the, kind of like the strip, hopefully, on that last picture as to where it was cut, like, you know, versus with the older bark. Um, so you have to really, really get to know the species. And the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because I'm kind of setting the stage for talking about the natural law. What are the trees saying to us, right? So I, being from PEI, I usually go home to harvest in my own district. And Kay and I and a couple of other ones, we go out. We're the only ones really in our communities that are actively harvesting bark. Um, we know that the trees are ready. Well, we, they used to be ready when the fireflies first come out. That's when the trees are ready. But with climate change and the pesticides, we don't see a lot of fireflies anymore. So now we kind of have to look for other markers. But that used to be when we knew that they were ready. Um, so when you go and harvest a birch tree, this is what healthy bark looks like. Okay. 
You see like really great color, um, like, like it's just, it's, it's beautiful, right? Well, I find it beautiful, you might not find it, but it's beautiful, you, you just look at it, right? Um, bark that from a tree that is not healthy will look like this. Can you see the bubbles and everything? And it does this even when, in the time of harvesting. And what happened was, was last year, it was post Fiona, right, the hurricane. And so when you're out in the woods, it's a, it's a real um, disservice to forests that we have been taught in Western science that trees compete against each other. Like I know when I was in biology, that was said it was like a race to the top, right? Like they're trying to get the sun, they're trying to get out there first, like it's survival of the fittest, all this kind of social Darwinism like being applied to trees. No elder that I've ever talked to or knowledge keeper that I've ever worked with that knows trees ever talks like that. What they do is they do this. And Western science is starting to catch up and they say they know like trees will pass nutrients to each other. Um, when we cut down an ash tree to make our baskets, the root system will actually be sustained by other trees with leaves until it can actually send up sprouts that will then get enough leaves that can produce its own chlorophyll and, and feed it, right? So they, they feed each other. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, they're capable of tracing um, something like the proteins, like if a bear eats a blumu on the side of a, a stream and it breaks down the nutrients from that fish they can trace throughout the woods like it's a very co like the coexistence this is really really strong in the woods right and uh, again on um, Guodum we're not the only ones that care for the trees other trees do too so Kay and I and my other friend Mel my cousin Melissa we we're out harvesting our bark last year and it was post Fiona and 40% of the woods in PEI were destroyed by that hurricane they're in horrible shape. But there are pockets where the woods look okay. So we went out last year, think, okay, well, we were very deliberate with where we go. We always check up on the trees that we've harvested before because we have that stewardship responsibilities. They get to be kind of friends. Um, so we were out, and even the trees that looked good and were in little areas where there had been no hurricane damage looked like that. And the moment we were like, oh, my. So then we checked, like, what is happening was those healthy trees were sending their nutrients and compromising their own health to try to help the trees that were around them. And so once we realized that that's what was happening, we voluntarily agreed as a group that we were not going to harvest on PEI. And so that rule, that prohibition of human activity, didn't come from the government. <laughs> Um, it anyway, didn't come from the government, didn't come from the elders, didn't come from our leaders. We got that message loud and clear from the land, from the trees, right? And so we'll, we'll go and check and see how they're doing this year. Hopefully they'll be a bit better. Um, but this is an example of natural law. And because it kind of requires, it doesn't kind of, it requires a degree of knowledge about the territory that is not easily accessible to people that are outside of our culture, it has the most difficulty being understood, right? If you tell somebody, well, you learn the law from the land. So this is why I bring the bark to show you, right, what the difference is. So when the trees are giving us a message, this you can see, this is understandable. You don't have to go out to the woods to know how to read them from the outside and stuff like that. So that's why I wanted to give you that example of it because like I said, it's kind of a harder knowledge to access. Any questions about that? Hopefully I don't sound like Pocahontas, yep. In your studies in biology, have you noticed that uh, when you have a forest of trees, if there's any infilling, it's trees of a different species? Yeah, and you definitely see that a lot like with the differences with the, uh, the black ash, for instance, because they depend on the water levels and things. And it's also interesting what happens with birch bark because you, the salinity in the soil, once that changes, the quality of the bark like, changes as well. So you can really tell when anything that's going on around in the woods because it has this ripple effect. Right? Minerals so, are the other variant. Pardon me? Minerals are the variable. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? All right. So deliberative law is easier. <laughs> this is when people get around, they sit together, and they decide we're going to write a law about something, 
Right? We're going to take action on something. This is very much similar to what our lawmakers in mainstream do. So usually this area, deliberative law, deliberately making a rule that people are going to have to follow, that's easier to understand than the trees talk to us. Right? So I put this up. This is actually a picture of the Mi'kmaq from New Brunswick and the holistic leadership getting together um, to work together on some legal principles. Right? On, so I, I wouldn't say it, like, it's Dublu Da'an, but it's uh, an only way Dublu Da'an because they're, they're allies of us, like they're separate nations. But this was the, the, the working together within New Brunswick and setting out rules and things like that that we need to be adhered to. So again, it's, it's not difficult to understand that. So I'm just kind of move along quicker from that one than I did with the trees. Um, the positivistic law, it, it's a little bit interesting how this plays out between different nations. Like I know as a Mi'kmaq person, we don't have, um, we're very much consensus based where our decisions are made traditionally with the entire community and if something is being decided the communities have the ability to ratify even if the leaders have agreed on something so we have this like communal expectation that if our leaders are making decisions that they will come back and ratify with the community so as a result the positivistic kind of approach to lawmaking I think aligns a little bit more with some other the way that other nations function where it's a little bit more top down Right? So with Mi'kmaq, we, te we tend to be a little bit less hierarchical, <laughs> not less, very like unhierarchical. Even the, um, the word that we have for our chief, uh, Sa'amal, means somebody who cares for people, right? So it's not about you know, authority and imposing on people. But an example of this is actually the reading of wampum belts. And so these are the terms and conditions of um, agreements that were made that were documented and codified using quahog beads in a, in a woven pattern that reflects the, the terms of the agreement. So reading that, like it's, 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 okay, this is what was agreed to, we have to follow it. Um, but again, some other nations that are a little bit more hierarchical, they have definitely a lot more positivistic law than I think we have in, in Mi'kma'ki. Um, but I put this up here just to kind of show people, I, I probably should put a picture back more about you know, what the design looks like on wampum belts. If anybody's in Montreal and the McCord Museum has an exhibit right now on wampum belts, highly recommend it. Um, oh, did they have a reaction from someone? Oh, I just thought that would be yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, and the, the, yeah, the McCord Museum is really interesting in terms of what they have, so, so that's there. Um, but yeah, so these are uh, the wampum belts, and it's really interesting because I always find that, like, in Mi'kmaq culture, we're, we're, the culture valley is all about balance, keeping things in balance, and I always find it interesting that the spokespeople of our nation were men, but as an elder, um, elder Bernard in member two says, don't confuse the spokes, like the mouthpiece with the brains behind the operation, because it was the whole community that were coming together, right? And so I find that with wampum, the role of women and the, is really not focused on a lot, but they were the ones that were actually making the beads that would get woven into the wampum um, with, with the leadership agreements and stuff. And if anybody is aware of quahogs, they're a type of clam, and it's really hard to get this color of, of shell and then to actually hand drill like the holes in it and make the beads. So it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so I always kind of raise my eyebrow when they only talk about wampum and, and in terms of who gets to interpret them because it tends to be more of a, the people that identify with the male role and the other roles within our community, women and other genders, they tend not to get focused on as much. Yeah? What about time frames and, and time if a rule changes? I mean, you still have the wampums from a certain period. Do you leave new ones? And, and how, you know, I guess the collectivity of the community knows that that is old law? Well, but a lot of our agreements don't expire that way. They get built upon and things. And so there's been a lot of work actually within the past, I'd say five years, where people are getting back to weaving wampum. And some people that are in active negotiations with, for instance, crown entities, are wanting to say, okay, well, let's record it in wampum. And that will freak bureaucrats out, right? <laughs> like this idea, but it's like, but this is how we always did it. And it's like, it, it's really amusing from an indigenous perspective 
perspective to watch the reaction of a group of people like, but how, do, how are we going to know what it says? How are we going to know the terms are going to It's like, oh my, yes, isn't that difficult when you're not the one that's in charge of holding the pen or the quahog shell, right? So it's, but yeah, so definitely like there's, there's a mood to create new ones, but the old ones haven't expired because they're meant to kind of continue on and like they, they reflect agreements that were meant to be kind of almost in perpetuity. Right? And it's, it also has to do with the fact like whether or not you're a linear thinker or not, that plays into it all as well. Um, but this really, like reading wampum and the idea of wampum and, and the idea of, like, like I said, like not controlling the pen, it really disconcerting for a lot of people. I don't know, I guess I'm asking. I saw when, um, when I was in the museum in Philadelphia in the fall when they were talking about how the wampum had not been respected by yeah. the people in the city of Philadelphia when they were negotiating with the indigenous people. So I just thought it seemed like maybe this is something that was it's not completely universal, but there's definitely like clusters of like nations around different like language groupings and stuff like that where it was used, as well as the interactions and the international diplomacy between nations where wampum would have been reflected. So it's it's definitely not universal, but it is um, there. It's more than just a couple of nations. All right. So customary law, this is actually, uh, the picture on the bottom is um, a group of the women in, in my family. Um, this is, again, something that is more, um, I think, accessible to people in terms of like, thinking about customary adoption, customary marriages. Uh, a lot of people don't know that one of the first recognitions of Indigenous law by the common law in Canada was actually the recognition of Indigenous marriage law. And what it was is that men of European descent had taken, um, or taken, had wives that, and they married based on the indigenous law of the nation, and then wanted to marry European women and have heirs to inherit their property, and wanted those marriages set aside, but the courts actually recognized the indigenous law. Um, so it's something that is not foreign to Canada, and even the Indian Act will recognize cost, custom adoption, so you don't, as long as you're upholding the indigenous law of the nation, they will recognize that adoption without having to go to court and you know, go to family law and that type of stuff. So I put up um, this customary adoption and the foster care just because the, the, there's been a lot of codification around education and children. And if you just think about the history of the residential schools and, and children and apprehensions and stuff like that, so it's not surprising that there's a lot of work regarding codification of this to make sure that it's really like understood. But there's there's a lot of customary law beyond that. Like that's just a real small drop in the bucket. Um, but again, like you kind of have to really get integrated to kind of understand this. Um, so material culture is the one that I've added. And like I said, again, with me trying to be a little humble, it's like, hey, John, what about wealth and material cultures and stuff? And this, again, has to do with the differing worldviews. So Waltus bowls and other items in our culture will have an animacy because we, we, we divide the world up between animate and inanimate. And so something that to mainstream Canadians would just be like property that you can buy, sell, trade, all this type of stuff. That's not actually appropriate for some of our items because they actually have animacy. They are a being, they're an entity in their own right. And when you think that there's a lot of protocols that come up around items, excuse me, where it's also inappropriate, for instance, for museums to put some of our things behind glass because they're meant to die a death. Right? Like this, this idea that you would keep something in perpetuity, keep it pristine, not use it, not touch it. And like I remember my grandmother was always just really flummoxed by this because like, she was a master basket weaver. And people would always come and say, like, Mary Jane, like, can you fix this? I said, what? Why would you fix it? And they're like, well, you know, like we, we love it and stuff like that. And she's like, well, like they can't let it go. Like they can't let it die. So she fixed it. Um, and my uncle always jokes that our family baskets have a lifetime guarantee. Um, but they are meant to return to the earth. And so this idea that there's laws around what you should do with them, how they should be treated, how you get laws from, from the sacred items, this is something that, again, is at odds with the commodification of things. Right? Um, so Waltus Bowls are a really interesting story in Mi'kmaq culture because they are um, a gambling game. And what's fun about them is that you draw on your connection with your ancestors to help you win. <laughs> 
So I always joke when I went against my husband, like, I'm closer to my ancestors because it's my territory, then he's got Irish descent, right? Um, but there's also a ceremonial component to these bowls. So it is a fun game. People play, you know, that connection. But they were also used in ceremony. And how they were used was that they would fill them with water and there was divination um, that would occur. And that did not sit well with missionaries and, you know, like the Indian agents and stuff like that. So a lot of the old bowls, you'll see, will actually have a hole drilled into them to prevent the actual full use and compromise that animacy of the object so that we weren't able to do it. So there are a lot of teachings around items, and it's really frustrating when people are, like, like they won't let them die. And I always tell people, like, if you want, you know, Mi'kmaq quill work, if you want Mi'kmaq basketry, if you like it, if you want more, don't hang on to the old ones. Support our rights in the harvesting and protect the environment to allow us to keep making, right? Like, that's the actual living, breathing component of it, not hanging on to something that's an, considered to be an artifact and then trying to keep it pristine and pre preventing it from dying the death that it's supposed to once it's been, life has been breathed into it. So again, it's kind of like this real clash in terms of worldview with respect to things. All right, so that's the end of the, probably the cool indigenous stuff that you may or may not have been familiar with. Uh, so before I move on, does anybody else have any questions with respect to that? This part, I won't lie, is not as fun. But, all right, so Aboriginal law. As I mentioned, this is the interaction between indigenous peoples, now you know how important that S is, and, and the crown. And we were hearing today about what is the crown, right? Um, but this is actually like, so treaties are an example of this. And in Mi'kmaq, initially our relationships with the crown were driven through um, military objectives, right? Because we, contrary to the myth of Canadian creation, um, there, there was no conquering. Right, that this land was settled. And this is actually a copy of one of the Mi'kmaq treaties that was signed here in Halifax, which actually is just over at the archives. If anybody ever wants to go see it, it's there, right? You can, you can it's, just, it's kitty quarter to the building. This is why I point in that direction, because it's just across the street. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is an example uh, of, of the treaties. And they were, in, in this part of the territory, they were actually signed on behalf of King George III. So if anybody watches Bridgerton, that was the king that our, our treaties were signed with. And they were, the Mi'kmaq component that got included with them had that foundation of the sacred treaties, all that worldview about the law, like Ongodom, Nedugalim, all these other principles. And so when I look at our treaties, I've never yet as a harvester been out on the land and thinking, oh well, like what I'm doing is not covered. Right, because it, it, it's all there, but unfortunately the understanding of it is not. So Aboriginal law is made, also made through things like pieces of legislation, um, court decisions, negotiated agreements for land use, all this type of stuff. So it's a very expansive thing, but this is why that guy out in Calgary was not practicing Indigenous law, like he wasn't talking about this stuff, he was talking about this stuff, right? So this is what Aboriginal law has its foundation in. So this is a quote by, it's a non-Indigenous um, researcher, William Wicken, and he wrote a lot about um, Mi'kmaq treaties and things like that. And this idea that the treaty relationship in this part of the, of the world, um, in Mi'kmaq, there was no um, effort on the part of the British, the way that there had been with the French, in order to understand our culture, understand our language, know our governance systems, to blue to on, all this type of stuff. So when you really look at the the relationship and the treaty relationship, there's a real dis, um, disconnect between the Mi'kmaq perspective of it and, and the Crown perspective of it that still exists today. So th this is the quote with him with respect to what the focus was, right? And so when you're talking about military threats, it wasn't this. The, the initial treaty in 1725 in Mi'kmaq, they, it was actually, it was meant to say, okay, all of the settlements of the British settlements that exist on this territory can stay, but it's like there's a hedge that's put around them. And if there's any expansion beyond that hedge, the full consent of the Mi'kmaq is required. So people have this misconception that because they weren't like the number treaties where the, the land sessions, that our treaties don't deal with land, they do, but in a very declarative way in terms of the territory, right? But again, there was a bit of a disconnect with respect to what was understood by that. So this is a picture of a treaty medal 
It, it is actually at the Museum of Natural History here in Halifax. Um, I don't think this one is actually currently on exhibit, but if you ever go down to the bowels and um, see their collection, they have so much stuff that is there. And so these treaty medals were, were given to people at the signing of them. And what's interesting about, again, our peace and friendship treaties here is that, have you ever heard that phrase, the, uh, like, bearing the hatchet? Did you know that it's actually bearing the hatchet and the musket? And down by Spring Garden, you know where the courthouse is down there? That was the governor's farm. It was on the outskirts of Halifax at the time. And there's actually, there was a ceremony where a hatchet and a musket were buried. So I always joke we should get out the metal detectors and go down and find out like where that happened. But it's interesting how the shift has been made from burying the hatchet and the musket. Because when you say just burying the hatchet, it makes it sound like the indigenous people were capitulating. Right? that they were compromising something and that the British kind of had a little bit of a dominance with it, but that's not actually what happened. And so when you look at how quickly that disconnect between the actual relationship um, happened, it didn't take very long. And so from a Mi'kmaq perspective, our treaties were like entering into a marriage. And I always tell people, <laughs> if you look at your wedding, a wedding ring, um, this is evidence of a relationship. And the relationship that I was in when I got married 20 years later is not the same relationship then. We've been through a lot, things have changed, we've changed, gotten a little bit bigger, this kind of stuff, right? But there's been a lot of ups and downs with it. But the relationship and the marriage is what has held steady. The treaty relationship from a Mi'kmaq perspective is similar. It was entering into a long-term relationship where we agreed that we would get together and work out things to prevent war. And you know, there was a lot of ups and downs with it, but it was really, it was it meant to be keep like keep going. It was never going to end. And so when you look at that type of understanding and then look at what the Canadian Constitution has to say, it divides this up between we get section 91 of the Canadian Constitution deals with the federal government. And because initially it was felt that if the indig if treaties and the indigenous relationship was left in the hands of local politicians, they would too likely be swayed by the people that vote for them and it would cause instability, right? So that was one of the reasons why like, responsibility for indigenous people was put at the federal level because it was more in the national interest than leaving it in the provincial, according to Peter Hawk. Um, so the Indian Act under section 9124 has as a federal responsibility in lands, um, Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And that's where the word reserves come from. Reservations are in the states. Total pet peeve of mine when people say it in Canada. Um, but we also have this section 35 that existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples are hereby recognized and firms. There's some wiggle um, words in there with respect to like existing, like they have to extinguish them. Um, and this, this whole idea, like from a, an Indigenous perspective, that means everything. From a government perspective, it often means it means nothing until we agree to what it's going to mean. And again, huge disconnect between those two things. So this whole relationship set up a dominance, a perceived dominance by the Canadian government, an asserted jurisdiction over Indigenous people that is not actually reflective of what the treaty relationships were about. Um, and so there, there's been a shift in Canada with respect to that. So when I talk about assumed jurisdiction, right, there was things that the Canadian government was never, ever in charge of. Because again, we're a nation. Right? We're a nation. So think about things like defining who is our identity, who are Mi'kmaq people. There was never any mention that that would be something that we wouldn't be deciding. Like it was ludicrous to think at the time of the treaty making that the, the British crown would be determining who is Mi'kmaq. Right? It just wasn't going to happen. Um, our leadership, the Indian Act, defines leader, who our leaders are going to be. Um, people were joking because the Indian Act actually doesn't require chiefs of an Indian Act ban to be Indians. And so somebody was like, because with, you know, with the primaries going on with the states, they're like, oh, somebody should nominate Trump for Millbrook chief um, coming up in the upcoming election. Um, so things like, again, like land regulation, harvesting, education, health. And so what happened is that instead of being partners, but nation-to-nation -nation relationships like the treaties, the government decided to start controlling these areas, 
right? And so the Aboriginal law, a lot of it has to do with Indigenous people <laughs> fighting against that assumed jurisdiction of the Crown over those areas of our lives. And under the Indian Act, they call it cradle to grave legislation, right? From the time that you're born until you die. It even determines where you can be buried. Um, I know when, like, my mother, when she, when, <laughs> The whole issue of identity, I was giving a lecture on it this week, some of you were there. It was always focused on men, right, not women. So the original definition of who an Indian was, was an Indian man, a child of an Indian man, and a woman married to an Indian man, right? So this idea that like giving birth as an Indigenous woman wouldn't make your child Indigenous is a really foreign concept. but. The government controls it, and they still control it today. And for some reason, Canadians don't have a problem with that degree of intrusion on Indigenous people's lives, right? So a lot of the issues, they also made it illegal to fight these systems, to hire, like raise money to hire lawyers and things like this. So I don't like you hear a lot of people, well, if you guys have had these rights, how come it's taken so long to get them? Like, well, the deck was really, really stacked against us. So a lot of the issue and a lot of the work is trying to get our nations back to having jurisdiction over this and, and just kind of taking back control, which is a really good segue. Anybody have any, like, that was kind of a weird, you can tell which one, which area of the law I have more fun with, right? Um, in the Section 35 jurisprudence, it tends to be, like, Has there ever been like consideration of how like indigenous legal traditions like affect like like a fishing right, for example? Like the fact that exists under maybe a different law. Has that ever been a consideration? Not enough. Um, because part of the problem, and I've talked with some lawyers that work, for instance, at the Privy Council and things like that, they truly think that everything that could possibly happen in Canada is accounted for under these two sections. Right? So if it's a section 35 right with Aboriginal people, oh, well, that's the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so the, there's, like, the way that the law has been taught is that there's no room. Mm -hmm. And so anything that Indigenous people want to do has to kind of be fitted in under the Canadian system. And so it's taken a lot to get people to the point when they're like, okay, we have multiple legal systems in this country, and we need to start working with them in conjunction with the British, like the common law system, mm -hmm. and not have it always be assuming that that is the default, yeah. right? So it's taken a lot to get to this point. But yes, like, and we've been saying it since day one, right? I, I remember when I was in my early like twenties when I first started going to these meetings with chiefs and stuff. I used to get so bored. I was like, oh, the rhetoric, right? Like they're just saying the same thing over and over. And I go to these meetings, like, oh, there's this chief again. He's, you know, I'm, I know exactly what he's going to say this time. And it took a long time until I get older to understand. Oh no, they're not a broken record. It's a consistency in the message and the teachings and the oral history of what our laws are about, right? So now I have a better understanding of why it seemed that way. But yeah, it's taken a lot to get to that point. Um, just the fact like that we have laws. You know, and, and there's been a lot of horrific quotes from the bench saying that, you know, their savages didn't have the capacity for it and stuff. And, and sometimes, I won't lie, it's almost easier to deal with the overt racist writings from the court as opposed to the, like, recognition that doesn't mean anything because it essentially has the same effect. And that's really, like, what difference does it make? And it's really unfortunate when you're talking about rights recognition. Yeah. Any other? Yep. Well, for one thing, like, like, so it does have, um, because the, legally that's what it means, right? The interaction with the crown. And Aboriginal people being the, like, it, it's like the indigenous people that were there at the time that European contact was made. So it's kind of like, as a Mi'kmaq person, I have Aboriginal rights because we are the ones when Europeans showed, you know, we are here, this type of stuff. That it, it's a little bit different than people that were kind of new to the territory, but happened to be there when Europeans arrived, but they were new to, to the area and stuff. Um, it's really, so yeah, so they've got legal definitions to them, but in general conversation, people don't understand the differences. And you see, like I see this around Facebook all the time, abnormal, aboriginal, that's why it's offensive. But there's actually a legal definition to it, right? So it's important to kind of know it, to be able to use it appropriately. Like I love just constantly using the word Indian because even if the word Indian Act under here disappears, we're still here in the Constitution as Indians, right? So even if the Indian Act disappeared tomorrow, Legally, my, like, I'm still an Indian, and so what, what are you going to do with that when 
And there it is in the Constitution. I mean, it doesn't say Mi'kmaq. And so then the idea is like, okay, well, does Indian, do they mean Mi'kmaq? Do they mean Blackfoot? Do they mean Cree? You know, that type of stuff. But yeah, but that's why. So the, it, even with their own communities, there's not a lot of like thorough understanding of why Aboriginal is used. But it's got a very specific context. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So even if the Indian Act goes away, and the question is, is that I know again talking with some of the lawyers at DOJ, they think well that because the Indian Act defines Indian, clearly that means the same definition applies here. But these are two separate sections. So do they have two separate meanings, right? And this idea that, yeah, like maybe one, because this is section 35, Aboriginal treaty rights, maybe this actually means Indian according to Old Nguyen Blue Dawn and not the federal government under the Indian Act, that takes a lot of persuasion. But that's how we interpret it. And what we tell DOJ we're gonna do. So I'm currently working, uh, I have a mandate from the chiefs in New Brunswick to displace the um, federal jurisdiction over identity. We're just like, we're done. We're done with it. It's been seven generations. He made a colossal mess. Get out. <laughs> and uh, they're like, what do you mean? So that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, so all of this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more forward. Okay, so one of the things that we have to understand in this country, one is to even understand those terms, right, the difference between Aboriginal law and Indigenous law, but also the fact of how much, I always say, like, creation mythology that exists around Canada, right? They're so quick to dismiss our creation stories as something that's mythological and has no founding of fact, and, like, it's absurd, like, how could we put that possibly true, like, Gloosecap brought the island to PEI? But the creation stories surrounding the Canada is just as fictionalized <laughs> right? Well, not that ours is fiction, but theirs definitely is. So there's a lot of legal fictions that have the foundation of Canada, but we're not taught that it is so, right? So the doctrine of discovery, right? you know, the, this idea that when Christian people arrive, then they can, as long as people are not Christian, they can take things, right? Terra nullius, no people were here, right? Look at Australia, terra nullius, there was no, it's like, no, there was indigenous people that were there. Um, doctrine of reception, this idea that when Europeans showed up, that the indigenous, like the only way to blue to on, didn't exist, and therefore all of the British law came to Canada and filled, like, did, there, was just, there was room for it. The idea that there was actually laws here that were valid, that were related to the territory, and also the idea that the colonial authorities at the time didn't know that, right? Because our treaties were, most of them were actually negotiated under protocols and custom, like, and the indigenous legal systems of the nation. Um, you look like the British hated having to spend so much money on feasting and gifting when they came to Mi'kmaq. The French were definitely used to it, you know, but the British hated the expense of it. But they had to do it because that they had to follow all the way to Blue Dawn when it came to working with people, you know, in this territory. Um, anyway, so this idea that there was no laws in Canada and all the British law just transferred over. You know, like I always I talk a lot about how William the Conqueror conquered England and set up absolute ownership of all the land on that island. And that, of course, is relevant to Canada in 2024, right? Tell me that that's not mythology, right? But, but it's a legal fiction that's the foundation of this system. Um, so yeah, the transfer of sovereignty by a French, Kent, um, I think it's Kent McNeil writes about this, um, about the fact that the people will say, well, when the British conquered the French, they got ownership of Canada from the French, right? So we breed the French, we get the spoils of war, therefore we, that's how we own the land. But what he says is that under French law, there was actually no mechanism at the time to actually acquire indigenous land. So the question is, how did Canada get the land? And that's why they didn't is actually the answer, <laughs> right? So all like unpacking all of these legal fictions that were taught as fact and as the foundations law and then to start to understand and build up an understanding of indigenous law because learning only way to blue dawn, it's not just about like um, learning the, the law, like on quota, you have to learn <clears throat> the language. You have to understand the land where the language came from, the worldview that goes into it. Otherwise, it's gonna be really difficult to really unpack it. And the tendency is to have the default be the common law, right, the British system. That's what people are comfortable with. And so that's why things like Nantical and people are starting to get a little nervous, right? It's talking about harvesting, like that, that sounds a little bit too much like what, you know, extraction 
and, and, and harvesting in, in terms of how Canada does it. We also need to deal, so reconciliation, what does that actually mean? Um, the government actually just had a report that none of the TRC calls to action were fulfilled last year in 2023. None of them. When it came to MMIWG, the COVID was used as a reason as to why the action plan hadn't been developed, let alone implemented. So we have all of these, like the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We have the findings of cultural genocide in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, actual genocide found in the MMAWG report, which was accepted by the government, right? They accepted the report. Um, so we have all of these things and a recognition in our constitution of Aboriginal rights. Canada does not have a recognition problem. We have an implementation problem. Right? An implementation problem. I recently was talking with a lawyer that was telling me that even like think about the fisheries here in the Maritimes where the moderate livelihood, right, that they found that the Mi'kmaq have a right to the moderate livelihood. The case law actually, my understanding is, comes from the United States where when they found that there was a right to the moderate livelihood, that meant 50% of the fishery. That's not how that got implemented in Canada. Right? So we have a lot of recognition of our rights. We don't have implementation of them. And a lot of times we see the political pressure as part of it. I always find it really disturbing that there has been some, as documents get declassified, right, cabinet documents and stuff like that, I was talking about this in class the other day, about how um, they focus, they had focus groups where if Indigenous, the, the situation for Indigenous people is contextualized in human rights, violation of human rights, Canadians get outraged by it, they want change, they want something done. We see ourselves as Canadians as being proponents of human rights. If the solution to those problems is self-government, Canadians will pull back from the issue. So oftentimes you'll see like, you know, the water, the boil water orders, the housing situation, the genocide, MMIWG, the child apprehensions. If we talk about human rights violations, people don't like it. But if they're like, okay, well, let's give recognition to the nations, give them self-governance, give them autonomy over this, that's when people are like, no way, right? So I always challenge people, why? Like, why is that, right? And again, think about like how we're taught to think about this. So again, I'll say it one more time, we do not have a recognition problem. We have an implementation problem. And unfortunately, that requires more Canadians to care. So, oh yeah, so this was the list of what Canada needs to do, right? Everything that they say they're gonna do, that would, that would be great. Um, the, this, these two points here, um, instead of, like, if the federal government has responsibility for Indians and lands reserved for Indians, instead of being control, that could be support of the indigenous nations, right? So it, it would be a shift, still possible as like a bit of a decolonization exercise, but we haven't even gotten to the point where we can neutralize the effect of the colonial policies that have led to the findings of genocide, right? We haven't even neutralized them. Um, we have more children that are currently in care than ever attended residential schools today. And yet again, we think about this issue with children and like, you know, being ripped from families is something that's historical. Well, the last school closed in 1996, right? Like it, it's done. N not, not, it's not so. So on the indigenous side of things, we need to heal. I always tell people that what we need to do is we need to neutralize the effects of the colonization, allow for healing to take place, allow for decolonization where the nations can actually get autonomy, right? But right now, self-governance is defined by the government. They'll say, this is who you are, and this is what your nationhood means. That's not self-governance. And also, if you have inherent rights, Inherent rights mean that it means no, like you have them regardless of what's going on external to you. If we have inherent rights as indigenous people, why do we have to negotiate what that means with the crown? Right, they're inherent. But again, we don't have that approach to this. So we need to be able to neutralize the effects of the ongoing genocide. We need to decolonize and get autonomy over these issues. And then we might be in a position where we can start indigenizing and working as a nation. But people kind of want us to go from recognition of the, the right straight to indigenization as if 150 years hasn't happened, right? And we just, we don't have the capacity to do that. And we see that happening a lot where the work tends to get offloaded onto the shoulders of indigenous people, 
And it's like, it's not our, like anything that deals with, like take for instance Dalhousie's recent uh, verification of indigenous identity, right? And they say, well, we're gonna go to the nations. The nations don't have an entity like the Mi'kmaq nation doesn't have con like um, consensus as to what the identity means. So what are you going to do with that fact, right? We're not at a position as a Mi'kmaq nation to serve the needs of the university. So that's not our problem. We need support in order to get there and the university has to work on decolonization, right? So, but there's this expectation and a romanticization. Oh, we'll leave it to the First Nations people and they will tell us what to do. We're not there yet on a lot of this stuff, right? But we have to have Canadians working on the problem and not just thinking that because, oh, it involves Indigenous people, it's an Indigenous problem, Indigenous people have to solve it. If, if it was our will that was the critical for this, we never would have had this happen to begin with, right? So we need to have, like, again, work on understanding on the way to blue to on. People, again, romanticize how much colonialism has been internalized by a lot of people. And that's not, like, our fault. It was just a very, like, there was a lot of effort put into making sure that we internalize some of these components. Um, asserting sovereignty, asserting jurisdiction. And it's one of the things I always tell people, like, I probably should back away a little bit from the microphone. Like, when I'm in the woods, I don't care what the Supreme Court of Canada says. And I recognize as a professor of law, it's kind of like, how could you say that? Because when I'm out there, it's the natural law, it's the teachings of my elders, that's what's ruling the day, right? So we have to make sure that we like, have that understanding and the strength to do it, and asserting our sovereignty, asserting jurisdiction over these areas. Because if we don't, the status quo is just gonna to continue to chug along. And then, that's my last point. Yeah, Lucy? It's unrelated. But it's still related. I don't have any children, and so I don't know what they learn in school. But what do history, uh, history books teach? It, it is changing. Like you take, for instance, Nova Scotia, they have at all levels of, of the, from K to 12, or primary to, primary to 12, every year they get culture, like Mi'kmaq teachings and stuff, a curriculum's been developed. And that's fantastic. Like I love the fact that when I go to my kids' school, everybody learns the honor song. The problem is they haven't actually also taught the teachers exactly. how to do it or properly resource them and things like this, right? Um, and it's like even take the language. They, they, there's resources and there's immersion schools, but they're on reserve. And I always ask people, like, why do people think that only Mi'kmaq people should be taught the Mi'kmaq language, yeah. right? Like, if you're on our territory, work, like, why is this not viewed as something that Canadians should understand? Right? Why do the crown officials that come to negotiate with us not have to go through Mi'kmaq language training? Right? Like it, it's, it's kind of astounding when you think about it. So there is definitely a lot of headway that's been made in terms of the education, but there's still like, there's a lot of catch up to do. And it tends to, again, like this idea that it's an indigenous thing for indigenous people only is a real yeah, barrier. Yeah, exactly, but if we change the education and the, the history books and then the yeah. other books, you yeah. know, Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, in some of the ways that Indigenous people teach, like going out on the land, doing land-based learning, everybody learns better that way. Everybody does. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, right? It's more effective. And so, again, like this idea, like, why do we do things the way that we do, right? Like, so, it, it, but the problem is it takes a lot of reflection on Can Canadians' part. And that being said, like, I'm, I'm middle-aged, right? But I, I, even over the 20-some-odd years that I've been working in this area, I've seen a lot of growth and a lot of movement, but a lot of it has come because more Canadians care. And in some ways, technology has really been helpful because you get a lot more access to resources and stories and things like this, right? Um, especially during COVID, like, people, like, think about the response to TRC. Like, when, when they found the, the mass graves, like, that was huge. Right? A lot of people got invested, but we, we need more of that. And so, like, again, if it's, if it's supposed to be just us fixing it, well, we've been trying ever since it started, right? So that, that's my little TED Talk part of it, right? Personal challenge to everybody here, right? Um, especially, like, being a Mi'kma'ki, we're verb-based. What's the action? Right? What's the action that goes along with all of this? This actually is one of a piece of my quill work. And this was a gift that I made for a couple who are getting married. And it has the cultural value that Mi'kmaq have with things to be kept, to be kept in balance. Like we don't believe that good always wins. Like sometimes 
bad does, right? Negative energy does. But everything has to be kept in balance. And so I made this piece for them as a couple because one was European or of European descent, a settler, and the other the woman was Mi'kmaq. And if you notice, even the grains of the bark go in different directions, but when they come together, they do make that whole. Right? So I, I like to have that piece up there to kind of reflect of what's possible. Right? Are we conceptualizing what's possible? Or do we see Indigenous people as a liability, a financial liability, and not an asset? Because right? the Indian Act, literally, even the decisions for chief and councils, it's all about um, expenditure of funds. And so people tend to think, well, how much is this going to cost? Why is it always about money? It's like, why is it always about money? Right? Why is it not conceptualizing how much more vibrant we could be when we come together? So that's why I put that picture up there. I know it sounds corny, but it's, it's really true. And then there's my modulus butt um, as an ending, just because, again, they're really, really cute. Highly recommend anybody uh, to work with them. But um, so does anybody else have any questions? Yes? Were there treaties with the French as well? No. No, the French had an active policy of integration in order to understand. So basically, like if you're coming um, for trade and things like that, it was it's better not to reinvent the wheel. So they didn't have um, as much restrictions officially with respect to learning the language and stuff. And, and fun fact, actually, for a while there, because the reciprocity was so strong with Mi'kmaq people and and our allies, that there was actually direction given for a while that the missionaries were to stop baptizing Mi'kmaq people, because it wasn't making us more Christian and French, it was making the French more like Mi'kmaq, because there was corresponding obligations that went around with that type of relationship. Um, so no, it was a different relationship. It also has been romanticized. There wasn't as much intermarriage as people think. Right? People think that there was a lot. There wasn't, because things on the European side were very class-based, right? very like, hierarchical, so this idea of marrying down and stuff like that. But no, there, there wasn't treaties with the French. It was much more of, um, I, I would say, kind of more of a working partnership. And it's also been romanticized, well, romanticized or twisted to think that we were kind of more puppets of the French. Um, but we weren't, like we always maintained our autonomy, right? So the actual nature of our working relationship is not really well understood. Right, well wasn't there, there was traveling, wasn't there back and forth to Europe by, by you know, years and years yep. and years 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 It even happened with the British to a degree. There was, um, oh, Halloran was a colonial uh, authority. A bit of a trigger warning here. There was um, one of his men had committed an assault on a Mi'kmaq woman, and he stepped in and punished him as he would if it had been a European woman. And so, and the way that he um, uh, comported himself, the way that he treated people as equals and stuff, he was actually officially adopted into the nation. There was like this massive, like three day ceremony about it. Like people came, it was up on the uh, Ristigush River, up in northern New Brunswick. There was like a ton of people there, huge ceremonies. And when he left this territory and went back to England, he was still upholding his obligations as having been a member of the nation. And so there was a group of Mi'kmaq dele uh, delegates that were heading over to go complain to Queen Victoria about the breaches of the treaty. And he provided letters of introduction to court and, and upheld that relationship even when he was back home with his family. So it, the, I always say colonization is individual choices, right, regardless of in, um, official policy. And again, another challenge, right? Like what are individuals responsible for with all of this? Because we definitely have shining examples, even in that era of people that were working towards um, respect and, and, and reciprocity and partnership and stuff. So, O'Halloran? Yeah. His name? O'Halloran. Yeah, his coat is actually, there was a replica recently made, I, I, yeah, I'll get to it in a minute, um, that they actually replicated his chief's coat that he was given, because if a chief in our, in our nation, if they carried themselves well, did well by you know, their, their teachings and, and treated people well, if they were in another village, the people there would add um, beadwork that represented their characteristics that were admirable. And so it was not only like a public, like, um, Recon like announcement of your good qualities, it was also something you had to uphold because everybody knew that you had these good qualities, right? And his coat was actually gifted back by the family um, to Canada. So it, it was at the, um, what's the Museum of Civilization called now? Uh, yeah, so, it, so it's there, but a replica was made up in Medibinagia, right? Because that's in that area, so it's really cool. Yep. For a comment, it's, uh, I'm on the Obera Brown Foundation. About three years ago, we worked with Dr. John Brown and Brown Pepper and Rito, 
I hoped we'd find the disturbance in the bearing of the musket that Yeah. No luck. I know. <laughs> it's like our best guess is it's under the parking lot of the courthouse. Yeah, <laughs> it would be so cool to find it though, right? Like it's just and like in the There's idea. Somewhere. Yeah, that there's like it's literally there somewhere. The treaty is just over there. It's like like this is real living like you know history and, and evidence of this relationship. And it's astounding how many people are like, oh no, the treaties don't exist. You didn't have the capacity. They weren't real. It's kind of like like literally we have them here, right? So one of these days, if you see me out at dark, mind your business. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what this is uh, can we learn uh, from safety? Oh, that's a very loaded thing. Basically, you can learn everything. <laughs> everything you didn't know, you can learn. Um, a lot of it is... One of the things about an Indigenous self-governance is that it's every facet of life is reflected in this, right? So literally every kind of topic you could think of has an Indigenous legal... like like. Like component to it. So it literally can be used a lot. And like I said at the beginning, it's, it's nice to know that we're now hearing from our knowledge keepers and our elders that it's time to share more, right? Um, so like you, you think like some of the obvious things in terms of environmental stewardship, you know, like sustainability, all this type of stuff, but also like, like consensus decision making, you know, like the idea that if somebody has done wrong to somebody, that it's about bringing the person in the community back into balance as opposed to punishing them, right? So there's a lot, a lot of lessons that can be learned and it's kind of like take your pick. But then you also have to work up a working relationship with Indigenous people to kind of start accessing it. And you have to, like, you only, it's earned knowledge. It's not entitlement to knowledge. So you start getting teachings kind of like at a kindergarten level. And then you have to prove that you're going to do well by them in order to access more. So there's a huge lesson in humility, patience, and respect that's required before you can actually just get knowledge from it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my specific question is related to natural resources and their use, and we have the concept of sustainable development or sustainability. And very specifically, ecological sustainability, which is a kind of uh, recognition of laws for, for nature, and we, we recognize ourselves as part of nature that we serve in sacred law. So I was wondering uh, what would be what would be the sustainable use or what are the limits for our use from the natural resources? That's a really <laughs> you can almost like write a dissertation just on that. Um. Yeah, that, that's why uh, the, the reason why I asking this question that I'm working on my PhD thesis <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Part of that is reflecting on indigenous laws and, uh, and how we can uh, learn from those laws and uh, have a change in the current legal system uh, rather than, besides, I mean, recognition of indigenous law in the current constitutional law act and constitutional law uh, in addition to that, how we can have a change in the current system based on indigenous law? The problem, I think, is that people want what, what has ha tended to happen when people talk about incorporating or considering Indigenous law is that they will take a component of it and try to inject it into the existing system. And in the process, it is so completely removed from where it's come from that it's the meaning of it and the effect of it gets extremely compromised. And so it's one of the things that people have to understand that if you're talking about indigenous law and legal system sustainability, you have to consider the entire worldview from, one, from whence it's come and not expect a small injection into our current system to have a huge effect. Because it was like, it, it's bigger than that. And this is what we've seen in a lot of like projects where people were like, okay, like, 
like circles, for instance, right? Like you tend to use them, or even like the two-eyed seeing concept. Like people have taken that word at like at Wumpdink and then used it in every possible application in academia. And they're not taking the time to understand like how does it fully function? Is it appropriate in this? And does it need to be modified in order to have any kind of effect? They tend to just be like, oh, okay, I understand that. I'm going to inject it, and then that's going to work. So it's this idea that you can't tinker, right? Like if you're going to deal with it, you have to deal with the whole system of it. And that's where the conflict goes, because most times people want solutions, but they don't want change. Any other? How's that for a note to end on then? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got five minutes, but thank you for coming. Thank you.